Well, it's 6.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I realize that some people are still coming in, but I want to make sure to respect everyone's time tonight. So as we get started, I uh, just want to do a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Hello. <laughs> uh, hello, good. Um, <laughs> Can you guys see the PowerPoint all right? I can. All right. Well, that means that we're in great shape then. Um, so right now I would like you to uh, uh, mute your microphone um, and then unmute it at any time you want to share your thoughts or have questions. <clears throat> you muting your microphone just helps down on the background noise and I'm just going to apologize in advance tonight. My dog may start barking. Um, she is outside just because we have some solicitors that are knocking at our door and I didn't want her to um, bark really loud, So, she, but she may bark um, during this session. So I just wanted to give you guys fair warning. Um, uh, anyways. You guys could type in your little chat box if you wanted to. Um, I would love to hear your guys' voice so it's a little bit more interactive um, for the people that are listening online um, that could not make it tonight. So, um, so yeah. So tonight's agenda. So good evening. Um, the agenda for our second live session module um, this, here's a little overview for tonight. Uh, we'll start out with reminders and important dates. We'll do welcome and introductions. We'll check in. Uh, we'll do a little bit with uh, locating the resource tab, uh, APA formatting in regards to the cover page, um, and then we'll get into some content stuff with importance of play. Uh, stuff that you've learned from the last module, um, and then the reflection and critical questions from Chapter 7, um, and then nurturing relationships, and then you guys will have time for questions and answers. So, reminders and important dates. Uh, please review the course calendar. Assignments are due for 11:50 uh, are due by 11:59 Central Standard Time every Sunday. Initial discussion posts are due 11:59 p.m. every Tuesday. Discussion responses to peers are due by 11:59 p.m. every Saturday. Next week we'll have our third and final live session, uh, Wednesday, March 7th at 6:30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, so, and also don't forget to work on your journal this week. It is due in next week's module five. Um, you should be writing an assignment, uh, writing one journal entry each week. This week's area of focus is how educators impact positive self-esteem. Additionally, if you do not attend tonight, so it's not for you, Anita, Alicia, or Magdalene. Magdalene was here. Um, I don't know if I see her anymore. Um, I will po I will post it for tomorrow and uh, I'm here. I what was that? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't I didn't see you up on the speaker there right away. I didn't oh, see okay. Alicia came on. <laughs> Um, so anyways, this is for the people that aren't here tonight. Um, I'll post it by tomorrow and they will be required to answer all the questions I asked during the live session, re, um, recording in regards to the lesson content that we, um, are going to do tonight. Uh, failure to not accurately and thoroughly will result in no points for this assignment. Each answer for each question should be a paragraph that consists of three to four sentences. Um, last week I gave uh, the people that were not in the live session um, a lot of grace. Uh, going forward, you will 
guys will need to answer the questions fully um, that are not just on the PowerPoint slides, but additional questions that I ask regarding to the content. So thank you for attending, Anita, Alicia, and Magdalene. Um, you guys won't have to write pretty much an extra paper, which is nice. <laughs> so welcome. Um, as most of you guys know, uh, I want to share I'm going to share a little bit about myself. I live in Colorado. I've worked in the public and private sectors as a teacher and as a director for the last 10 years, and have worked in the public schools. I am an education supervisor for a Head Start program in Denver Metro. The picture that you see is me and my family from this summer. We were at Disneyland in California. Um, that is like one of my favorite places to visit because the beach is calming and it's peaceful. Um, California in general is kind of busy, but I just love the beach. Um, so anyways, uh, yes, thank you, Mag Magdalene. She, she is cute. <laughs> she, was she was premature. She was born at two pounds. Um, so, you know, she just started to walk uh, right before her second birthday. So, you know, she does have some some development issues, but, um, you know, it's her timing, um, not mine. <laughs> um, oh, that's nice. That's nice. I have my dad son. He's now 14, and he was born half a pound. Oh, wow. Yes, half a pound, and he's a big boy, and yes, the development that they have is under time. Um, he actually started walking when he was going to be two and a half, but he's now 14 years old, and he's amazing. He's he's wonderful. I love him. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. So, since you're on, Magdalene, what's your favorite okay. place to visit, and why? Um. Dominican Republic. Why? Because that's home to me, and the beaches out there, it's, they are amazing. Blue, clear water. <laughs> and I just get to see the family that is back there, so I just love it. It's home, and I love it. It's in the Caribbean, so I just love the Dominican Republic. Um, yesterday, we just celebrated the Independence Day, and um, everybody was out celebrating. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I want to travel abroad at some point um, if I ever get a chance. It's kind of tough when you have a little one um, yeah, to do nice. that. Um, but yeah, that would be awesome to um, go travel there. Um, try to go back to your roots. Yes, it's, um, it's really you? nice. It's beautiful. <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing. Alicia and Anita, um, what would you guys, where would you guys like to visit and why? <clears throat> so Anita um, is writing in the chat. She said she's from Chicago. Her favorite place to visit is Hawaii. Um, she loves the island life and the tropical fruit and the beaches are awesome. That's another favorite I would like to visit too as well. I haven't been um, around the world that much. Um, the only place I've really gone to is Canada um, and some of the lower 48 states. Um, but thanks, Anita, for sharing. Um, welcome to class. So Alicia said she is from Washington, D.C. Um, her favorite place to visit is Miami. Why is that, Alicia? I don't think I've been west or east of the Mississippi. So I have a lot of traveling I need to do. You you have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I've been to a lot of places, and now I'm kind of envy of my cousin. She just went to China, 
in India, and I'm like, oh, no, I need to catch up with her, but now it's going to oh, be wow. on hold. Oh, wow, that's that's awesome. Um, So Felicia said favorite place was to visit is Miami because of the places to eat and the beach. I am... Um, you guys are all making me kind of jealous. <laughs> I kind of want to go to the beach right now. Well, welcome, ladies. Um, moving forward. Um, so how is the class going so far? Um, seems like all three of you guys are doing really well in the class. Um, are you guys reading the announcements each week? Um, exploring the resource tab um i'm gonna get into my next slide um and show i'm sure a lot of you guys know what's going on um and how to find the resource tab but maybe some of your colleagues um might not so i just wanted to take a moment and share that yes alicia it is going really fast um these five and a half week courses are absolutely fast. <laughs> um, but I'm hopefully you're enjoying the course and you're getting um, something out of it. So going to locating um, the resource tab. So how do I get to the resource tab? Uh, I've decided to do just a little visual for the reference in case um, maybe some of you guys are still trying to navigate through Blackboard. So here is how you locate the resource tab. Um, first of all, what you want to do is, let's see if I can get there. You want to go to your class and then it should bring you up to a page that looks like this. Um, in the top right of the page, it will say resources. Click on that tab. Once you click on that tab, you will come to a, a, play, a page that looks like this. And I provided this visual so you all can navigate and find the APA formatting, which will be my next slide of how to do a title page. Um, and all the other resources. Rasmussen College has to offer uh, the tutoring platform, the library, job stuff, et cetera. Um, you guys could check it out um, whenever you have a chance. But one of the things that I wanted to go over tonight, uh, because I think it's pretty important, um, I know in last week's assignment, um, we there are many of you guys who are missing points on your writing assignments just because you did not have a separate cover page. Um, the APA format requires you to have a separate cover page that includes the following in order. I provided an example to ensure that all of you are doing this correctly. So um, I'm glad that you guys are here. So basically, it needs to be the title page, your name, Rasmussen College, and then at the bottom of the title page needs to have the author um, note that states this paper is being submitted on so-and-so date with the year um, for Mike Hager, EEC 197 Exploration One Knowledge Course. If you do this each time an assignment requires a title page, you will never lose any points um, going forward. So, Use this as your guide, um, just so you guys can ensure that you guys are not going to lose any points um, for the APA formatting. Does anybody have any questions? Magdalen asks, do we need a cover page for the journal? Yes, you do. I believe that is in the rubric. Um, I could double check for you, Magdalene, and 
give you an answer through course messages tonight and possibly post that on um, the uh, announcement page tonight. Just uh, let everybody know if you guys need a cover page for it. Um, I could double check for you. I don't know offhand. Is there any other questions? <clears throat> All right. If there is no other questions, I'm going to move on to the content for tonight. So, um, last week you guys did uh, a little bit that the mo module was on the review, um, the importance of play um, and what it should look like. Um, so with that being said, um, what factors would you think would make play um, less enjoyable? Um, you know what play should look like. What would play? What would make it be less enjoyable to a kid? Feel free to use your microphones, guys. Yes, I said less enjoyable, Meglin. Um, we know how, what importance of play should look like. How would it be less enjoyable for a child? Um, well, I think they will not enjoy if you give them directions on how to play and cut them short on play time. I think they will not enjoy play time at all. You're absolutely right. Um, how much play time do you think a child should get, say, in a child care setting? Um, I think an hour will be fine. It depends how long the child is going to be in the daycare. That's a good point. But, yeah, but let's say, like, my sister, she's sending her baby for three hours. And if it's something like that, that it's only three hours, I don't see why the child cannot have, like, an hour to an hour and a half of just play time. I mean, most of the time at that age, I assume that they are going to be playing, but they also need their nap time, their snack time. So I think an hour is fine. I completely agree with you. Um, I know in our center we open, um, we're a Head Start program, we open at 8.30, um, our doors open at 8.30, school gets released at 3 o'clock, and the children are, um, we require our teachers to have the children have free play at minimum of an hour and 15 minutes um, per day of just free choice centers. And then with that, I mean, there's, you know, your morning circle, your snack, um, nap time, your lunch, um, outside play. There's just so much um, in a day. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, a good hour and a half, an hour should be great. How about Alicia and Anita? Do you guys have anything to add to that? What do you see that would um, make play less enjoyable? I know correcting a child's work is not good. Um, I feel like that, uh, or when adults' environments are, you know, we want to make sure that we have good interactions with children. Um, 
However, they also need to make sure there needs to be a balance with what kind of experience that they have. So Anita said, if the adult was mean or to the students being mean to them, yes, children will probably not, um, well, they probably would not like you very well, um, and it would be a constantly uphill battle with them, um, creating that relationship. What I'll be talking later on tonight um, is key for any early childhood program. Do you have anything to add, Miss Alicia? What factors might restrict play? I think, you know, factors become more restrictive when children are directed to a specific interest area. Um, I've seen it in my program, which I actually am not um, a fan of. Um, interest areas and in, they're rotated on a time schedule or when material and toys must stay in one interest area. Uh, for example, block stays in the block area. Um, I feel like that is almost, um, you're letting the child explore, but you're not really giving them any autonomy um, of letting them really explore and uh, create something, um, something special. So basically, um, their their like their imagination is just bond to one area, not letting them express themselves in different areas. Because maybe they can use the blocks in the reading area, and probably you know put a book on top of the block or something like. Their imagination is just gonna fly if you let them play in different areas. I think. No, you're exactly right. Um, keep them restricted to one area is not best practice. Um, and some people say that free play can be restricted when you give them less than 45 minutes of play offered in um, a child care program. Um, and, you know, just not having a rigid, and if there's a rigid daily schedule with many transition between activities, um, that can also disrupt um, play as well. Anybody else have anything else to share? Anita says she cannot hear me. Can you hear me better, Anita? Magdalene, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you good because I use my cell phone in order to call in, so okay. I don't have a video camera, so I think some of them, they should do that. They should probably try, or they probably think that they do need a camera in order to, <laughs> to be part of it. Sure. Can you hear me a little bit better, Anita? Hmm. Because, yeah, I'm, like, right up to the microphone. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm almost yelling. 
Um, Alicia, can you hear me? All right, Anita could hear me now. She's now reconnected. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it kicks you. It, sometimes it kicks you off. I understand. It does get frustrating. Um, Anita, do you have anything to add, or Alicia? So since they can hear you now, maybe you have to repeat the end the question. Okay. Um, I have not heard enough. The sound was going in and out, so no. Um, so the question is, what factors might restrict play? And Magdalene talked a little bit about um, not giving the children enough time to play. I'm not sure if they heard you or not, Magdalene. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but I heard you, so. Uh, Alicia said being told no. Um, yes. That happens a lot with my two-year-old. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of move on to the last question um, with module three. Oh, Anita had something. Play can be oh. restricted by having disruptions in the classroom, um, not having favorite toys, not having freedom they want. You're completely right, Anita. I talked a little bit, I don't know if you heard me, um, about transitions. Um, if you have frequent transitions and have a rigid daily schedule, um, those disruptions can be um, a big factor with restriction of play. So thank you for sharing with that. Um, the last question for module three um, that I wanted to cover. Um, so just please to share something that you've learned in module three and how would you implement what you learned in this module um, in your teaching practices? Uh, if you are watching online, uh, you will need to answer this question in detail um, to make sure to receive full credit. Um, so I just really want to go over um, what you guys are doing in your classroom, and maybe you guys are already doing it, um, but what have you learned from Module 3 and what are you thinking of possibly implementing it if it's not in a classroom or in a home care setting or something that you might want to implement even if you're not currently working in a preschool classroom?
Okay, I'm going to go ahead. All right. <laughs> well, what I have learned, I'm still not sure what age I'm going to be teaching or, you know, what age group. I mean, like it could be infant, it could be toddler. But being that I have my nephew, he's almost two years old, I'm more drawn to that age, but I can still change. And one thing that I can, I take, I took away from this um, module is that um, give the children free time to play without giving them restriction. Like I know my sister, she, oh no, play with this toy. And you have to, like, I don't know, in a way she's like, whatever toy she feels that he has to play with, that's the one that he needs to play with. So <laughs> I guess when I have like where I'm working or if I have a daycare or whatever I decide to use, it's like what we discussed before. We give them the freedom to play with whatever they want to play in the area that they want to play. And also for like the preschoolers, another thing that I like is also give, giving them the opportunity to solve problems, to talk among each other, to figure out how they're going to solve any problems that they come up with, even if when they are playing. That's two takeaway that I got from this module. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing, Magdalene, and you're exactly right. Um, problem solving skills don't go away in life. <laughs> as no, you get older, yeah. and as you get older, I mean, you just, you learn that, um, that there's problems that happen, and we got to make sure that from a young age that we start preparing our young ones to make sure that we give them the tools to do just that. So thank you for your response. You're welcome. Ali <clears throat> Alicia just wrote, um, she doesn't have kids right now because her, um, her center is new and just preparing to open. That's exciting. Um, but when we opened, I will have, she'll be with the infants and we'll make sure they have enough area for them to explore and crawl to just let them choose instead of forcing them to listen to a book instead of um, them wanting to practice pulling up. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Alicia, will you do any tummy time with the space allowed it? For the children? Yes, yes, tummy time is very important for infants. Anita said I would give them more open ended play so they can have more freedom and build self esteem through problem solving and talking to one another. Thank you, Anita, for your. Um, good. That's a good answer too. You know that problem solving and building their self esteem is a foundation. Um, the foundation of learning, and um, that kind of brings us to our next slide. So, um, um, oh, Alicia also added if they don't like it. Um, Yep. I would get on the tummy tie as well to show them it's very important. And that's great. It's great to model that behavior even from a young age. Um, it just shows them that you care and that you're loving and you're nurturing. So. I'm going to move on. The reflection and critical thinking questions from Chapter 7. Um, so basically, in Chapter 7, you are learning about establishing effective environments for young children. You are all supposed to come prepared uh, to answer questions 1 and 3 of the critical questions 
at the end of chapter seven for tonight's live session. Now with that in mind and thinking about your own teaching practices, let's talk about question one. Um, so think about and discuss ways learning environments affect children's behavior, relationship with peers, academic performance, and what do you see as the most important element in environment and why? <clears throat> as you guys think about that question, um, I'm just going to give you my opinion of what I think. Um, you know, nobody's right, nobody's wrong. Um, it's just what you think. I believe the most important um, person, I believe the teacher is responsible for making the environment conducive to all children uh, in their care. Uh, the teacher is one who needs to bring in the child's home and culture into the classroom so transitions are smoother for children. So, for example, asking the family to bring in a photo or photos of their children or child at home doing the things that they typically do with their parents and other important adults in their lives and posting the pictures at eye level help children. Another example is providing a variety of books in the library center and different food, clothes, and dramatic play that is culturally responsive to children that are in your classroom. So providing these items for the children, you can make the classroom feel more like their home, which in turn will make the child feel secure in the environment. When, when the child seems and feels emotionally safe in their environment, a child's behavior and the relationships with peers and academic performance will have positive outcomes on academic performance. So that's just a little bit of what I think. Um, you know, really building the child's self-esteem, like Anita said, um, by meeting them where they're at and making sure that you are culturally responsive to them um, and making their home life um, fit the classroom. So Alicia touched on that. She said it's their safe haven to come to every day. And you're exactly right. Um, and as teachers, we really do need to make sure that we are really building up their self-esteem. Go ahead, Meglin. I think you were trying to talk. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, a way to keep also their environment affected is uh, having a clean place for the child to come into. A clean and organized and like, I want to say germ free, but I know a lot of kids, you know, <laughs> you can really avoid germ free an environment, but cleanliness, you know, it needs to be clean. I've seen places that they will only have it clean the first couple of days that the kids are going to come in and then afterwards it's like the toys are raggedy, the the books are like ripped. I mean, the kid needs to come in every day to a classroom or an environment, a daycare, that the place is clean, that the child will feel like they're in a nice place, is, is home, have the, 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 the games and the tools that they need for their education to be in a nice condition, not raggedy or old. You know, I think it's, it's the teacher's job to always exchange them and even the crayons, the all, all those things, it just needs to be nice. That's how I feel. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. I think that's a great point too. I think that um, having old things and having stuff that's torn, one, just it's 
first of all, it's really, really, well, kind of disgusting. <laughs> um, and it, it, and it's just, it doesn't show pride in your classroom either as a teacher um, if you're not keeping up with those things. Um, I agree, just, but then, then there's like some people that they don't do this for the child. They Most of the people just do it for the money. And although there's not that much money involved in this, you need to be more <laughs> concerned about the well-being of the child. You need to invest in new toys. You need to invest in new activities. You need to invest, invest in new, um, the materials that your classroom, your daycare, your, your preschool that it's going to have. For sure, I I think that's a you do make a great point. Is yeah, investing and making sure that um, those things are replaced and rotated, and so people, so the children do have fun, engaging activities um, for learning. <coughs> Anita responded, she said the classroom and the teachers are the first stop to make a child's day better. If you have a good array of books, toys, um, and you give them love and still show them the right and wrong way and still teach them um, um, what I feel affects them, also allowing them to help. And I agree with Magdalene with the cleanliness of the area. Um, she also said, I feel us teachers are second parents along with educators. And you're exactly right. I mean, for some of these children, you are raising them because if they get dropped off at 6.30 at night or in the morning and get picked up at 6.30 at night, well, that's 12 hours of their day. That's 12 hours of their day, meaning that if they woke up at 6 o'clock to get to child care at 6.30, and then they get picked up at 6.30, um, they're only with their parents probably for an hour or two a day, while, you know, you guys are there with them for multiple hours a day, sometimes 8, sometimes 10, sometimes 12. Um, so it really, you know, you guys have a very, very difficult job. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, and, you know, like I think Magdalene said, you don't get paid much money to do it um, because this is the wrong business. <laughs> if you do, if you think you're going to get paid a lot, it's more um, a passion to do it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's great. Alicia said, we spend most of the time with them. Yeah, you are, you're completely right. And, you know, at times it's sad, but at, you know, you got to take pride with it. I, I think that what you guys do is it's almost like being like super human. <laughs> <laughs> so, Moving on, so this is the next question I had. Uh, if you if you were to be asked to design a one-room child care classroom, what would be the most important influences on your decision making it presented from chapter seven? Uh, it says you may choose from a philosophical position um, or a more practical idea. So with that being said, um, what would your classroom look like? Would it be culturally responsive? Would you have the library center near um, a block area, which is a loud center? Um, why or why not? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in my case, I like the Montessori um, setting for play, for a school, for a classroom, I mean. 
And um, I, I, I like her philosophy and I like um, her theory. So I don't know how would I answer this because Well, I think um, I think you would start by saying that you would like a clean classroom to begin with, right? Well, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you know, just like the design of the physical space, what would lo that look like? I mean, would you have um, home-like features like pillows, curtains, plants, student photos? Um, would there be defined boundaries, pathways? Well, uh, for me, it's going to be an open space. It's going to be an, an open space and around the walls. Like, the, I'm, around the walls is where I'm going to have the areas. Let's say reading, um, blocks, um, um, play area, um, but open. I, I don't want... Um, how can I say this? I think some classrooms that are divided. I don't want to divide it. Like some, sometimes they have bookshelves divided in one area with the other one. I think it should be open. My classroom is going to be open. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> my classroom is going to be open, and um, the chairs are going to be on the side, not in the center, but, like, on the side. So the child can have like freedom to wander around in different areas that are going to be provided for them. I don't think a child should be enclosed in just one little area that looks like a cubicle. It's frustrating. <laughs> it should be open and free for the child to go everywhere they want to. I'm trying to picture that and that, you know, that's something that I have never saw or seen. But I mm -hmm. think that would be very, very unique to see. And um, I just wonder how the children would, just wonder how their behavior would be in a setting like that. I'm wondering too. But it's because I don't like the cubicle area. No, like let's say in, a, in the reading area, okay, it's open, they have a mat, they, the floor mat and everything, but then next to it is a bookshelf and dividing the other area, which is the block area. But why can't I just have like an open concept to everything? Mm -hmm. That does make sense. I mean, when you think about it, when you go buy in a house nowadays, you want an open concept, open layer, open this, because you want to see everything. You want to see more. You want to see what can interest you in the other side. But when you have like walls or divider, it's, you feel like you're, oh, what's that word, complicated inside, like closed in. This is where I'm supposed to be now. Claustrophobic. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it, in, uh, in all honesty, I mean, too, are you really watching the children if there's dividers? I don't know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of supervision do you have of the children? Um, and I think that's why, as teachers, we just need to always make sure that we are repositioning ourselves when we are in the classroom while children are at play. Mm -hmm. um, so I am going to see a lot of conversation in the chat box that I wanted to share. So Anita said, her class would be clean, the room would be diverse. Um, she would have a, a designated areas for the children so they can build routine depending on the age group. That is great. Yeah, depending on the age group um, might make a difference of what kind of, what your room does look like. Um, Alicia said that, well, this is interesting. The space of the room, um, it would be diverse, and I have a Regio Amelia class for infants. Every toy we had in Learning Center are handmade. That's awesome. 
Um, Regio is like free base play through art and environment. Um, she also said I would divide mine into separate um, the cribs and floor area for the infants to crawl freely and not get hurt. So yeah, it depends on um, what age group you're working with too. Well, thanks ladies for sharing that. I do like your uh, perspective on um, what a classroom would look like. Um, so the last thing I wanted to go over tonight, um, if you guys don't have any questions, um, is nurturing relationships kind of fall, it falls into what we are talking about um, this week. Um, with that being said, um, you know, what are some ways you can positively nurture relationships with young children and their families? Um, how will you get to know them before entering your classroom? I know I'll, the reality is that sometimes you don't get that choice depending on what kind of um, setting you're in. If you're a Head Start setting, um, it's a little bit different than a daycare setting. Um, just because the daycare setting is usually year-round, they enroll people or enroll children and then they just kind of give them thrown into the classroom. Um, Alicia says they have orientation with the parent, which is fabulous. Um, Head Start does the same thing. They have two home visits that are mandatory through the performance standards. Um, that they get with the parent to know the child. Um, they discuss parent goals for the child, daily schedules of the classroom, um, classroom rules, and just culturally associated items they could bring in um, to make it more conducive for uh, the child. Um, you know, with that being said, what are some ways you can pos positively nurture relationships with young children and families. Um, I know that Alicia says uh, they do the, after they have orientation with the parent, they do the transition days. They come in for two days and stay for a half a day, um, which is a good practice to do as well. Um, what else is there? Anita said, by being a listening ear, attempt to have a meet and greet with them, have multiple family days so the parents can see how their child interacts. Um, um, I agree with them. <laughs> with the parents pace um, we go with we go with their parents pace um, yeah that's those are all great ideas um, to nurture relationships um, you want the parent and the child to feel as most comfortable as possible by doing that um, I just wanted to um, did you I have, have anything to add, Meglin? Sorry. Yes, I, I will. I have, yeah. Well, um, this is something that you would do when they are first starting to go into your classroom or daycare, right? I mean, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. the, y yes, you want to get to know them, and that's a good way to start to build that relationship with them. Okay. And, and so then what? <laughs> And then basically, yeah. what, once you know their cues and you know how they are, they could relate to you a lot better than 
have, say, having the child drop off and then they're just crying and then you have no idea how to really sue them. And so having okay. those, yeah, so having those connections with the parent and um, meeting the child really helps bridge that. Because also I, you can, like, for example, I mentioned to you that my nephew, he he just started going to daycare, and he will cry almost every day, every time my sister um, left, um, and what the, the caregiver suggested that my sister will stay during breakfast and feed him and play with him, and then while he... Um, He's interacting with the other kids for the for her to leave. So I'm um, I'm guessing also the parents can um stay with the child and spend more time while they transition. So like that, the teacher can get to know them and how the mom plays with the child and what does the child like and how he responds to what mom is saying or what the teacher is saying. I mean, I guess that's one way of building relationships between the parents and the, the child. For sure, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, like Anita said, you know, being a listening ear is sometimes the best thing you could do. So Anita said kids talk a bunch sometimes all they want is for someone to care and that goes for the parents as well and you know I'm being a parent and being a child care um, teacher it's a tough job it's not easy and I mean a lot of times you know being that listening ear does go a long ways for nurturing those relationships, um, not only with just the kids, but with um, the parents too. So um, the web link that you see at the bottom is um, a kind of what I'm gonna leave you with tonight. It's a TED Talks video about relate, nurturing relationships. Um, in ECE. Um, if you guys get a chance to look at that um, and watch it, go ahead and do it. Uh, I do encourage you guys to view that when you get a chance. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I can click on it or are you going to leave it for us on the on the email? On an email. I could send it um, through course announcements and post yes, that. Yes, please, because I try to click it right now and it's not going for me. Yeah, it's not going to click for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'll send that in course announcements tonight so you can view it. Um, it's a good TED Talk video. Oh, my God, I don't know what I just clicked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... That pretty much concludes our um, live session tonight. Do you guys have any questions about the information present presented in the session? Um, any questions about the course expectations in general? Um, all three of you guys got full points tonight. I appreciate you guys for uh, sharing um, and making a good open dialogue tonight. I don't know what I hit, but I can see nothing. I only can hear you. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Um, <laughs> so Anita asks, yes, do in total, there's only three journal entries due. Um, do we have a question to answer after this for the discussion? That's Alicia's question. So let's answer Anita's first. 
So in total, there's only three journals. So there's a journal, I believe, for um, two, three, four, and five. So I think there's a total of four of them that you need to complete. Uh, I could double check um, on that. You can also go yeah. to the course calendar um, and look that up too as well. Um, but I can write an email to give you an accurate um, accurate statement um, of what all journals need to be um, that need to be submitted. I think there's five, uh, not five, four, sorry. So I think it's from week two, week three, week four, and week five. Um, but I will double check. I think you're right. It's two, three, and five. Um, so Nita said she didn't see module five. I'll double check, Anita, and I will um, post that too on the announcements. Um, Alicia says, do we have a question? Do we have a... Do we have a question to answer after this for the discussion? Um, the only question that you have to answer, so the live session, you don't have to answer anything. I will automatically put in your points for you um, for attending. Um, the only question that I would like you to answer is if I have a follow-up question in your initial post for your discussion. So if you have, um, you write your post, your initial post for this week, and then I reply to it with a question. Just answer that. Um, so you, you know, just check check with your discussion, um, check on your discussions to see if you have any questions that I have or maybe your peers have. All right. Do you guys have any other questions? Is that your daughter? That is my daughter. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> She's so cute. <laughs> that is my daughter. And now she, that was about a year ago. Now she has curly hair and has oh, glasses. Nice. I like so, the vintage phone. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, that was taken um at the Children's Museum here in uh, Denver. Oh. Wow, cool. <laughs> she has quite the imagination. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, if you guys don't have any other questions, I appreciate your time. And um, I will try to get those questions um, up to, um, on the announcement page tonight. Um, if you don't see it tonight, it will be tomorrow. Um, depending on how much grading I have. Um, so yeah, I will make sure to get that up. And I, if you guys don't have any other questions, I will see you next week um, at 6.30 on Wednesday. All right, have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, good night. Bye. Bye.